us in Mauritius, the feeling I have when I walk in public and when I hear people is that we are waiting for it to come. Because we feel, there is this feeling outside that it is inevitable. It is going to touch us if it has not already. In Singapore, at some stage of the this disaster, there was a the confusion as to whether people who were suffering from dengue were in fact really sufferers from dengue. But finally it was found out that it was not dengue, but it was COVID-19. What happened in Singapore, Mr. Speaker, sir, was that there was an adjustment made to the verification method, the testing method, that brought out the truth. And it is always, in a situation like this, good to do all that one can do in order to know exactly what we're facing. So in light of all those facts and figures, it is quite normal that you see people in Mauritius rushing to the supermarkets and trying to buy basic commodities because they are afraid. Is it not human, after all, for us to want to preserve our lives and those that of our loved ones? We rush to the supermarkets, we rush to the shops, we buy out because we're scared, we're afraid, because we do not have visibility. We do not know what is in store for us tomorrow. We do not know. I have come to this assembly today with one thing in mind. I want it to be understood clearly that we cannot we cannot score political points on issues such as the coronavirus attack. And that does not only go for the opposition, but it also goes for government. This morning, when the Honorable Leader of the Opposition was putting questions, questions that are simply a reflection of what others outside want to know, the people, those who are afraid, those who are legitimate questions. If he has been stern, if he has been firm, it is because people are concerned out there and he has only been expressing the concerns of the people, our people, our brothers and sisters outside this August Assembly. The Honorable Minister of Finance thought it fit to score political points. I leave it to his conscience. The Honorable Minister of Finance thought it fit in this day and age, at this moment of crisis, to refer to 2008 and how he's doing a better job. I leave it to his conscience. At this time of grave danger that faces us, Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm not concerned about what happened 10 years ago or five years ago. I'm concerned what is going to happen to us from now on and what is happening to our brothers and sisters all over the world. There are Mauritians who live outside Mauritius. What's happening to them? There are Mauritians, our friends, our families, our kin, living in other countries, in Europe, in Asia, in another con continent, far away from their loved ones. What's happening to them? This is my concern, just as it is the concern of those listening to us. If the Honorable Minister of Finance thought it fit today to try to score political points, it was cheap on his part. I did not want to come here prepared to in any way criticize government about the past, but he's opened the door. I'll try to limit myself because it is my duty in order to rebut whatever he said but I will try not to go as low as he's gone. Because the citizens out there have better things to do than to listen to this, what he's tried to do today. The citizens out there would like to know one thing. 
How many beds have we got? How many beds do we have in our health institutions that really could take care of Mauritians if we are slammed by this virus? How many ventilators do we have? Because at the end of the day, what is of utmost importance is that those who will get violently attacked and who will be touched by this virus will need to have ventilators in order to be placed on artificial respiration. That is a fact. Do are we ready? I've heard Honorable Xavier Luc Duval speaking on, in one of his interviews, a press conference recently, saying that we have only 50 ventilators in Mauritius. If that is the case, Mr. Speaker, sir, then we have a serious problem facing us. 50 ventilators. Imagine, imagine 5% of our population getting infected. Imagine. 5% and even 1% even requiring ventilators. We don't have enough beds. We don't have enough ventilators. We do not have the, the facilities and the health facilities to take care of our population. And then, no wonder people are afraid. I expected the Honorable Minister of Health in his press conferences that are welcome. To come and tell us, just as it's done in Singapore, as it's done in the United Kingdom, as it's done in France, as it's done in other developed states. Tell the people the truth. Do not hide behind some closed doors and give only information that you want to give. Tell them, be transparent. Is this not what the World Health Organization has recommended we do? Yes, it is. Tell us, how many beds do you have available? How many ventilators do you have available? How many dedicated hospitals have you got pertaining to people who could be slammed to the earth, to the ground by coronavirus? How many people have you trained? What are the facts? What are the figures? What about the testing that's being carried out in Mauritius? Have those tests been validated? No, they have not been validated. I have inquired myself. The tests have not been validated by any authority as it should be validated. Why? And why is the Honorable Minister of Health keeps quiet about that? I'm not giving way. I'm not giving way because standing orders say I should give way and I'm not giving any way. I'm not giving way. Is it is it a point of explanation or a point of order? Point of order. Which point of order? Point of Which one? <laughs> He's misleading the house with tests that has been done or validated. No, that is that is a point of explanation. You can have uh, because he is misleading the house. Stage. Yeah. You see, that's the problem. Minister, the Honourable Minister doesn't even know the difference between a point of order and a point of explanation. I'm only repeating what the Speaker said. God's sake. They still don't know. Why is it? Why is it? I've, I've inquired, as I said, since he tried to interrupt my line of thought. And didn't manage to, thank God. I went to the Mauritius Ports Authority. I wanted to find out about that vessel that had parked into, and coming with 1,200 passengers on board. I wanted to find out whether any one of those passengers have been tested for coronavirus. Because I've read the press and the press has said they have been tested and they have been found clean. Rainian Island refused to receive this vessel. Rainian Island refused to receive this vessel. Madagascar refused to receive the vessel. The newspapers in Mauritius base themselves on reports emanating from the Honorable Ministers of Health Office to say that they have been tested and have been found to be clean, coronavirus clean. 
There is nothing more dirty than lies. None of them have been blood tested for coronavirus or tested in other way. Honorable Shakim Mohammed, you stated the word lies, lies being unparliamentary. Please, withdraw it. I did not say that anyone has lied. I said the ministry has. That's not, that's allowed. I never said someone has. I said the ministry has. And I'm very careful on that. So what applies to an individual also applies to the group. You know what, Mr. Speaker, if it pleases you for me to withdraw it, I will withdraw it and I'll say it again and I will withdraw it. If that pleases you, I'll not get into a, a battle of words with you. It is wrong and untrue. Is that better? Please don't comment on the chair, please. I'm not commenting. I'm only seeking your, your great advice. I'm saying whatever the Ministry of Health has been saying, supposedly that they're coronavirus free, is wrong. And it is totally untrue and unfounded. And I'll explain why. Because I myself, I've inquired personally with the officers of the Minister, Ministry of Health. Has any one of those persons been tested with any kit of any form for coronavirus, for COVID-19, the 1,200 passengers, have they been tested before being allowed to descend and come on Mauritius, the earth, the territoire mauritien? And the réponse, Monsieur le Président, a été très simple. No. They simply have been tested to find out whether they have a fever. And since not, they did not have a fever, they were allowed to disembark. That is the truth. So when you have a country like Rainier Island refusing them to disembark because of the risk associated, the risk, the risk is enough. Simple risk matrix, if the Honorable Minister or this government knows what it means, a risk matrix. How does one draw one out? And understand what are the factors that could cause risk, what are the factors that can be implemented in order to reduce risk. Would have indicated to him that if Rainier Island has decided not to allow this vessel to come in and anyone to disembark, if Madagascar has not allowed this vessel to come in and anyone to disembark, why is it that Mauritius has without carrying out a single test specifically to find out whether that person carries the infection COVID-19? It just was pointed out with a gun and this is what was reported to me and I'm reporting it to this assembly. Pas un seul des 1200 passagers de ce paquebot n'a été testé, be it with a swab or with a blood test. No, none of them. And anyone could have simply taken some Dolipran one hour before arriving and then you go and test them, for God's sake. That is what I'm saying is risk assessment. Know how to run a country, risk. So what are we going to say therefore if nothing happens and we don't get anyone here? We'll all be the happier. But it indicates to us, Mr. Speaker, sir, that this is a government that only is running the affairs of this country on the chance that we do not all get destroyed. On the chance that nothing goes wrong. What is the explanation of this Honorable Minister of Health? Why is it that other jurisdictions did not allow them to come in, we allowed them to come in? And the same thing is happening. I asked people at the Mauritius Sports Authority who work there. They have told me that when they are told not to wear masks, they are told not to wear gloves because the, the management of the Municipal Sport Authority say, if you keep on wearing this, people will start panicking and people will start believing we have a problem. Do not wear masks. Do not wear gloves. Those are the directives that the employees of the Mauritius Sports Authority are receiving. Passengers from the airport, supposedly going on quarantine. I mean, actually, I was wondering, and this is a simple question which has been asked. You have people who are going to quarantine. Some of them could be infected. 
So simply on fever, you're sending them to quarantine, and those who don't have fever, you're letting them, them in. I myself, we were allowed in, just shot it on my forehead. Hooray! But we were not asked what, that we should be tested. We've come from the United Kingdom. No. Can you imagine if I'm to start coughing how everyone would run? <laughs> but then again, then again, I would like to have an explanation. And yes, Mr. Speaker, sir, the Honorable Minister should give an explanation. Yes, he needs to raise a point of explanation. And he has to explain the people of Mauritius. Pourquoi est-ce que those passengers on board the 1,200 were not tested? Why is it that in Japan, when people had a problem on the Pakbo, they did not be, were not allowed to disembark until every single one of them was tested? Why is it in Japan, when they, before it was even declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization, at the time when the Honorable Leader of the Opposition came with his first question, and the Honorable, uh, the Honorable Raoult, gloatingly was trying to teach on old Bulel about what exactly is the virus and how it can contaminate. And he was even saying that you're a doctor, you should know better. What arrogance. And at that time, they were beating upon their chest, so happy that when Honorable Bulel was saying this was a pandemic, when he referred to it as a pandemic, they all laughed. Even the Honorable Minister of Health he grinned. Even the Honorable Raoul laughed, made fun of it. And today, the world is in turmoil. <laughs> My God. <laughs> so can you imagine? And then, and then, you want to know what the response of this government is? I've looked at the cabinet decisions of the 13th of March 2020. And I looked at the sectoral level measures that are taken, cabinet decisions, with all these good friends and honorable ministers that are in cabinet. Let's see what exactly they've decided to do. The passenger fee on air ticket would be suspended for tourists from Réunion Island. Why does one suspend, why does one suspend passenger fee on air ticket? Why? In order to encourage them to come. So the response of this government on the 13th of March, on the very next day of our independence, was to come up with such an intelligent measure. Let's encourage people from Réunion Island to come to Mauritius. Bring down the passenger fee air ticket suspended for tourists from Réunion Island, Australia, and South Africa. And all three, Réunion Island, they have infected people there. Australia infected people there. South Africa infected people there. And their intelligent reaction was what? Come to us. Come. Come home. Let us come and welcome you open arms. Let us have a little kiss. Let us have a little, you know, take you in our arms. Come to Mauritius. We'll make it easier and cheaper for you to come. Come along. That was their intelligent reaction. Oh, I'm get, oh, please, let me get to that, sir. Let me get to the whiskey part. Actually, I heard a little story, Mr. Speaker, sir, that since there's a lack of hand sanitizers on the market, that the government come, came up with a very intelligent me measure. And uh, it's, um, it's unfortunate that the Honorable Minister of Finance is not here, because I hear that, that basically he, he, he was of a paramount role in that measure. You see, he ensured something about whiskey, isn't it? The bottles. So instead of, instead of two bottles, you could buy three bottles, yes. isn't it? Yeah. I wonder what it was for. I mean, why do, you, why do you make it easier for tourists to buy alcohol to come in? Or Mauritians? Or six bottles of wine? Why? Is it to kill the virus? Or is it to wash your hands with the whiskey? With the alcohol, because there is no hand sanitizer? 
Or is it to encourage tourists to come to Mauritius because Mauritius is a shopping destination where you come to the duty free and it's easier and cheaper to buy alcohol than any other destination. That was the, the, what they had in mind. I hope nothing else. And if this is what they had in mind, do you find this a government that has got the credibility and the ability and the knowledge to gérer une crise de cette proportion? To allow tourists to come more from Réunion Island, make it cheaper, allow them to come and buy whiskey even more? This is their reaction? And, oh my God, page two of the decisions of cabinet. Page two, paragraph one, one, four. And I'm sure the Honorable Minister Kalichwen would be interested to know. Oh, well, obviously you would. Chair, Honorable I'm addressing you. I'm saying I'm sure the Honorable Minister Kalichwen would be interested to know. But I can look at him. He's a nice man. Let me look at him. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a good friend on top of it. Let's not forget that. Oh, God, I think I've just <laughs> killed him there politically, but anyway. Uh, Air Mauritius would pursue its promotional fair strategy to attract tourists. Check that out. On the 13th of March. You know, Mr. Speaker, sir, on the day before the 12th, if memory serves me correctly, was the day and the date when the World Health Organization had declared that it was officially that this COVID-19 was a pandemic. Okay. So the next day, bright idea on the part of government. It's a pandemic. Outside, there's a pandemic. The world, the planet is suffering. We are the only few countries, and Honorable Boda said, where we don't have the problem. So let us have this brilliant idea. Promotional fair strategy for a tourist, to attract tourists from Réunion Island, from UK, from South Africa and Australia. Not only are we going to make it cheaper in terms of passenger fee, but we're going to make it even cheaper and easier for them to come to our territory by reducing airfares to Réunion Island reduced by 50%, while the others reduced for 40%. Hotel rates would have discounts. They think that this is helping the tourist sector. We'll give them a discount. Let's bring in infected people. Stay in. But you'll pay cheaper because you're infected. Is that it? Port charges imposed by the Mauritius Ports Authority and Cargo Handling Corporation would be waived for all exports up to the 31st of December 2020. The problem that the Honorable Minister of Finance fails to, fails to understand, and he's every time been saying it's a technical issue. It's a technical issue. It's a technical issue. But I'll tell him what the technical issue is. He's got a technical problem. <laughs> and his technical problem is as follows. You cannot compare what is happening today with what happened in 2008. In 2008, we had to face a different type of economic crisis that had to do with commodities, that had to do with oil, that had to do with a global financial crisis, that had to do with, with, with credit crunch. We're talking about a lack of finance on the markets. That was the big problem of 2008. Government stepped in and ensured there was no loss of employment. That he does not say. How is it that there was a global financial crisis in 2008? We came up with new legislation that was not loved by anyone, but had to do it in order to save jobs. It was done. It wasn't popular. But when government can take decisions that are not popular, this is a measure of their courage. This is how you measure courage. We saved jobs. We created new jobs. But here, the problem is and I was talking to some friends in the industry. When you, come, when you talk about, let us look at all the small-scale enterprise, the SMEs, les marchands ambulants, those practicing in the informal sector, they have to buy little goods from China. They work. Today, they have a big problem. They cannot find goods from China. They are indebted and they are not within the big boys club that's being protected by the Honorable Minister of Finance. That club of business Mauritius, that club 
those little people working on the streets everywhere, those traders, that, that are not a fardeau upon government because they take care of their own, they trade, and they lead a very difficult job. To say, petit commerçant, that sell little biscuits for children, that sweets, drinks, that have their own little vans distributing everywhere in all the tabagis around Mauritius, that are selling in the little markets, that have to buy raw material from China in order to manufacture. Those people, the Minister of Finance has found nothing in order for those people not to avoid driving straight into the wall. He has no solution for them. He has proposed nothing for them. The Honourable Minister of Finance talks about port charges imposed by Mauritius Ports Authority to be waived on exports. How do you manufacture if you have a supply side disruption? How do you manufacture anything if you have a supply side problem? If you can't find simple things like buttons, simple things like material, simple things like, like little raw materials required in order to produce anything. The textile industry is in dire straits because it imports most of its raw materials required from China. It has to have alternative markets. What is this government doing in order to help the textile industry, the export-oriented industry, the other small-scale enterprises? What are they doing in order to help them find alternative sources of supply? Nothing. Nothing. So, when I look, I hear the Honorable Minister of Finance saying that he that the, here the honorable minister of finance normally you, you you block it first and then you wipe address it no no normally mr speaker i invite you to tell him that you should and not afterwards because you're closer you got the issue you see even the clerk is doing this this is not part of that and, uh, <laughs> for how long more are we going to be able to sit? Uh, and when I look at the, when I look at the, yeah, la boutique du Mauritius Duty Free Paradise à l'aéroport va proposer une remise de 15% sur tous les achats par les touristes jusqu'au 30 juin 2020. Is this one of the great solutions proposed to the coronavirus problem? I mean, when I compare this to what's being proposed by other governments and other jurisdictions, I was talking to someone in France. The government has decided that most people now are going to be indoors, work from home. This government says they're going to start encouraging a policy of working from home. Are they serious? How are they going to start that right now? It is not within our culture to work from home. In the midst of this crisis, now we're going to start this whole thing about working from home. In France, the government has come forward and say that 50% of the time that someone works, will now he will be on chômage technique in France. And the government will pay and compensate this half the salary of that employee. It's going to cost a lot of money to the coffers of the state. But they will still put the money in because they want to ensure that from the moment when coronavirus is no longer a threat, that it does not take time in order to stand up again and be strong to run this new wave that is going to come. The new wave of opportunity. But here, what are we proposing to employees? What are we proposing? At least we have to be able to prepare. The Honorable Minister of Finance says we're going to propose to them what is available in the Workfare Programme Fund. The Workfare Programme Fund, something else which is very economical about and does not say, was set up by the Labour Party in 2008. It was Honourable Minister Banwari then in 2008. The Workfare Programme Fund did not exist before. Why is it that he does not at least acknowledge that this was something that was good to, 
Today, he says he's going to use that Workfare Program Fund, set up by the Labour Party, that he's so good at criticising, and this is going to help the workers. But no, what he does not say is that he's setting aside only less than 500 million rupees for the workers, but he's giving les patrons 9 billion rupees. That is the facility that he's offering to the, to the, to the patrona. 9 billion rupees for le patrona. And that also, God knows how it's going to be disbursed. No transparency. And then only 400 or so million for the workers. Peanuts. Take that and go. If at all. And then again, which section of the law is the Honorable Minister of Labour going to rely upon in order to, 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 to give this money out? A section of the law that says that he has the total discretion to decide how it's given out. That we are not in any way able to question that discretion, neither does he have an oversight committee in order to see to it that it is disbursed properly. This is a section of the law that did not exist in 2008. This is the section of the law that was introduced last year. Yes, that I admit. I confess. In the old days, when we were in power, money could not be distributed by the minister willy-nilly. It had to be done according to strict parameters. But with the new law, the minister has the power to do it. And we cannot in any way question that. So, that is, that is great governance, actually. Now, I have also heard the Honorable Minister of Finance take the opportunity of explaining all the great deeds that he's doing. But I read a report on Baker Mackenzie, by Baker Mackenzie, on the impact of COVID-19 on key African sectors. Because this is what we want to know. How it's going to affect us. Not only the health distraught that we're going to be find ourselves into because of the mismanagement of this whole affair. And then the only thing that the, gov the, the government will be able to do is what? We, and, and we all pray that we don't have a case in Mauritius. We all pray that. Then the government is going to say, we don't have a case in Mauritius, but we are the ones who manage not to have, bring a case into Mauritius. This is what they're going to say. If there is no case in Mauritius, and it is in the interest of one and all, because this virus does not choose, at least there's one good thing about it, it does not choose political color. It does not choose age. It does not choose social background. It does not discriminate as this government does. But if we don't have it, then they will say, we don't have it because we did it. We, we sorted it out. But if it comes down to Mauritius, they will not plead guilty. They will say, it's not our fault. It's the pandemic. At this moment, as I'm speaking to you, Mr. Speaker, sir, they are hiding behind the fact that there is this coronavirus problem worldwide to explain the difficulties our country is facing economically. If it is so, if it is so, how come before the coronavirus outbreak, our country is already indebted? Wasn't it already indebted to almost 65% du PIB? Is it more? 70? Everything is increasing. But for the Honorable Minister of Finance, inflation is low. The price of commodities are low on the world market. That is not a problem for him. He thinks that it has no effect on the fact that inflation is low. The fact that inflation is low for the Honorable Minister of Finance, it is all he is doing, his government's doing. The fact that Honorable Boda believes that soon we need only 500 US dollars in order to be in the one of the richest countries, high income earning countries. But what he doesn't tell you, how is it distributed that wealth? Then the Honorable Minister, Honorable Minister of Finance will say, well, at least we have put in another 8 billion because of pension, etc., etc. We are talking about exceptional situation that requires exceptional courage and measures that this government has not shown it fails to understand the urgency so when i was reading 
When I was reading the report of Baker McKenzie on the impact of COVID-19 on key African sectors, the Honorable Minister of Finance has not even touched on a very important sector. Fair enough, it is not his ministry. It's that of his colleagues, the financial services. How many mergers and acquisitions being done on the African continent will, because of COVID-19, be delayed or annulled? How many mergers and acquisitions in, the, in Africa over the next few years is being hampered by this COVID-19? And why do I say it's important? Because a lot of mergers and acquisitions is dealt with from Mauritius. Capital raising and IPOs. I read here, African issuers have been waiting several years for an improvement to political and economic instability in Africa before going ahead with any planned capital raising. Will this not have an impact on capital raising and IPOs? What about the impact? Our global financial institutions are currently assessing the impact of COVID-19 and reacting to its economic impact. How are they to adjust to a new and unprecedented circumstance brought about by the virus? Are any of our companies insured against COVID-19 impacts? The answer is no. What about infrastructure? China, that had started the Belt Road and Road Initiative, BRI. The Chinese policy banks loaned $19 billion to energy and infrastructure projects in region for 2014 to 17, and almost half of which was in 2017. The effects of coronavirus has already impacted activity around China's Belt and Road Initiative, a multi-billion dollar plan to link Asia, Europe and Africa. So, what about trade? COVID-19 is expected to impact China's global trade activity for several months. Not now. It's not going to get better in two weeks' time. Several months. What is the Honorable Minister of Finance proposing? Through the Economic Development Board through the friends he has in business Mauritius. What are they proposing? What are the alternative sources of supply to the Mauritian market? What is he proposing apart from all those technical difficulties or issues that he cannot comment upon for technical reasons? What about energy and mining? How many holding companies, how many operations are carried out through the, the financial services sector in Mauritius? for energy and mining in Africa from China and other Asian countries. Will this not be affected? And if this is going to be affected, how many funds will not be created? How many funds in Africa will not see the day, light of day? Will this not have an impact on our financial services sector? Those are issues which I do not blame the government for, but which I humbly implore, I humbly implore the government to look into. Not because we have to score political points, because it concerns the survival of the country. So yes, yes, when the Honourable Leader of the Opposition suggested last week that we have to work together in order to find solutions. Working together does not mean just dismissing our ideas as though they are worth nothing. Working together means having the resolve to do it properly. Arm's length, respect for each other's ideas, because this is the time for us to be able to put our political egos aside and stop hiding behind facts of 2008, 2001, or God knows when. Given us going as far as Honorable Boda going as back as 1976, how did that really help people of today in 2020? facing the coronavirus situation when they are to really find out what happened in 1976, what were the number of seats and the percentage figure of the Labour Party, I do not know. This is not really what people want today. People want you to protect them, protect their children. Even those who are not in Mauritius, protect them, help them, say, not only say, but in, not only in words, but in deed. In action, show that you have the ventilators that our country do not have. How many is the Minister of Health going to import? When are they going to get to Mauritius? 
How long is it going to take to get to Mauritius? What are the procurement measures? Are the, are, is he going to use emergency procurement? Is he not? What are those details that he's not giving us? Why is he not giving us those details? Is it because we do not have and he is just simply relying on the possibility that it does not come to Mauritius? Is that it? So, in actual fact, Mr. Speaker, sir, I was listening to Honorable Boda, Honorable Obigadu, Honorable Ariram, even though I was not in Mauritius for a while. I had to make the effort to listen to them uh, because it does take an effort sometimes to listen to them. And Honorable Obigadu was someone who really surprised me during his allocution. This was the same gentleman who today states that he is very proud to have made his choice, albeit. He can choose whoever he wants to be with. He was so quick to criticize the MMM for being so long in the opposition. Someone who fails to understand that our system of government not only includes opposition but also government, he basically puts forward that being in the opposition is in fact not interesting and he's not interested in that. And what I understand is that through the negotiations that he has embarked upon, prior to the elections of 2014, he has made a good negotiation. So it's no longer a question of what do you believe in, the cause, it's no longer that. It's no longer that. He puts himself on the moral high ground of supposedly doing politics differently and trying to dictate to others what is right and what is wrong and how he knows best and everyone else is wrong. He is very good at that at giving lessons, the donneur de leçon. He is that very same person who met me and told me that soon we're going to be candidates together with the Labour Party. A few weeks or days before the elections. So finally, he had a very good deal there. No, no, fair enough. Pardon the pun, but I choose where to come. And I do not sully it anywhere. I choose where to come. But then again, it doesn't mean because we do not come on the same side that we are, we are enemies. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that we do not, we do not share the certain ideals, but it means that we can still be friends with different ideas and working together. But what I do condemn, not the Honorable Prime Minister, he's the leader of a party at the MSM. He believes in his ideals, a party that was created many, many, many years ago. Fair enough. But what I find wrong is that someone who is, was with a party for many, many, many years, who, has, who puts himself on this moral high ground to give lessons to others, who has criticized the actual Vice Prime Minister, Honorable Minister of Education for education plan who has been so critical about her education plan today sitting in a minister's position and forgets about his criticisms about that education plan and puts it aside because to him what is important what he believes in as a cause no what is more important to him is to be in power and to not to make the bad negotiations of the PMSD because he said the PMSD did not know on which side to be and he wrongly chose that was that is how you judge someone's character was the cause important to honorable obigadu no was what you believed in important no because if it was what you believed in that was important he would have stood up against the education reform of honorable dukan and of this government ever since the previous mandate why is he all of a sudden silent about it why an honorable Ganu, we've been in the opposition a long time. We've been in the opposition and I've been in government, he's been in the opposition. But the one thing about Honorable Ganu I respect is that we've always had a good working relationship. No matter where we have been, on each side of the chamber, we've had a good working relationship. Honorable Ganu has gone as far as to say in a radio interview that I should be very careful because I have supposedly said that he has blood on his hands about the Metro Projet, Metro Express accident. When I never even 
open my mouth on that day. I know where you got the information from. Some people who are not used to hearing things in parliament because they're so new here. Some people who do not know how to decipher who says and who doesn't and gives you wrong information. And he went on, went on to say on radio and obviously on Waza FM, which is one of the, one of the, well, the loudspeakers, if I may use that, the loudspeakers of government. <laughs> Only one time. The other loudspeaker. The other additional one. Uh, and, and, and he went on to say that I should be careful because I, in other words, making allusion to blood on my hands. You see, let me say it publicly. I have respect for Honorable Ghani. I will not lay the blame at his feet. He was wrongly inspired and I thank him for having apologized to me. He hasn't done it in public, but he has done it in private. But I should say, to à son honneur, à son honneur, peut-être qu'il n'a pas pu le faire en public. But I say it publicly, he's apologized. I rang you because I, I thought that it was right for me, for me to tell you that and not go and fight with you otherwise. And he was honest enough to apologize. And I thank him for that. And it was big of him. Yes, and he called me back, which is what gentlemen should do things. But, but, what I find really, really sad is that today you have members of this government, members of this government, I remember Honorable Ganu talking in press conferences, Honorable Tanya Jol sitting next to him and saying about the Metro Express that there needed to be transparency. Yes. You recall, Mr. Speaker, sir, my good friend, Honorable Ganu, can very well say he still says that. So much the better. But he can say as much as he wishes, but there still isn't. Because let's remember what was in the government program of 2000, uh, 2014. What was in that program? In that government program, 2015, actually, there was one line in there. Freedom of information access to information the great policy of this government for five years was to what ensure that there was access to information freedom of information very good and that reminds me that reminds me of what happened recently in france you see the greeks i will not be what honorable tanya jol has done as to bring in rihanna uh, uh, within this august assembly uh, but the greeks forgive me I shall, I'm not as contemporary as she is. The Greeks have got two words for the concept of time. It's chronos, which is very simple, chronos. And then there is something else, yeah, chronos. And there's something else, another word for time, which is called kairos. Kairos, as opposed to chronos. Chronos is the chronological element of time. Whereas Kronos, whereas Kairos is about the opportune time. That is the difference. You see, each and every time, <coughs> yes, be careful. <coughs> each and every time, each and every time this government since 2014, December, and 2015 until today has been in power. Honorable Ganu was sitting there. Each time this government said, well, you know, you were in power, you were in power, you were in power, you were in power. At some point in time, Honorable Ganu got so fed up that he said, come on, you can't keep on using the same excuses. You can't keep on using the same excuses because you are in power now. And he was right when he said that. Honorable Ganu was right because they are in power. It's for them to act and to stop looking into the rearview mirror and keep on saying, oh, well, you did this, you did this, you did this. Kairos, the opportune, opportune moment. It's time is now. It's for you to do it. Stop telling us you were in power. You should have done it. What are you doing? You are in power. The freedom of information is for this government to do, not for us. We are away from power. We are far from power. We will not be in power. So please. I was just reminded that the Labour Party had also promised a Freedom of Information Act in its manifesto. And in fact, your, the Prime Minister, Namin Ramglam, said he had changed his mind because when he listened to what Tony Blair had said at one time about this, this bill. 
Very good. So is he therefore telling us that the leader of the Liberal Party is still right? I'm just, I'm just so what is he saying? I'm not giving way anymore. So what is he saying? Oh, well, because the leader of the Liberal Party said that, therefore, we are right. Is this your excuse? You are using Dr. Navin Ram Gulam, leader of the Liberal Party, because he changed his mind. You believe, therefore, that this is an excuse for you not to come up with it? The leader of the Liberal Party said that at a point in time. That's why I meant. I'm not talking about Kronos. I'm talking about Kairos. Some people don't understand between Kairos and Kasros. <laughs> Kairos. What does it mean? When President Macron was visiting recently a hospital in France, he was visiting a hospital in France and met a specialist doctor about the COVID-19. He said to that doctor, he's there, he's going to give support. And that doctor turned to him and held his hand, shook his hand and did not let go of his hand and said, listen, give all the support you can to the Minister of Health. Give more than you can because we have done as much as we can. We can't do more than that. Le corps médical a donné tout ce qu'il peut. You have to do it. And then President Macron said, you know what? To the, to the avament, when he said, when he said that doctor that, uh, uh, President Macron said for one whole year, the doctor said for one whole year, there's been a lot of dilly-dallying and not really doing what has to be done. Then, Finally, President Macron was answered. The doctor said, no, 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 Kairos. It stopped looking at what was done in the past. You are in power today. What are you doing? So the Honorable Minister of Finance is so good at saying what happened in 2008. How does that help someone who is facing COVID-19, maybe already in our midst, and I hope it's not, or maybe coming soon? What does that really help? This is the same Honorable Minister of Finance that went on the radio station after the victory of 2019, who said when he was asked about the indebtedness, la debt de l'économie mauricienne, you know what his answer was? Figures are not important. It's a state of mind that's important. <laughs> he said that figures are not important. Les chiffres n'importe peu. Les chiffres n'importe peu. He said that, word for word, the chief import per, an honorable minister of finance telling you that the rate of indebtedness, in those days it was what, 65, to date 70, soon he, from what his understanding about the world order, it could even be 100%, who cares, you know, because we're having a COVID-19 right now. The chief import per, but when he has to talk about inflation, then the chief can't. Whenever it suits him, then it is important to him. But what he fails to tell us is that the situation we are facing is very serious. Why I believe we cannot believe this government and we have no confidence in this government. Clearly there has been traumatized. People are traumatized on the other side of the house. They say we are traumatized. They are traumatized and I'll explain why they're traumatized. Every single member of this government, as though like parrot-like, has come up with a speech. In their speech, no, come on. Yes. This is unparliamentary. Parrot like. Parrot -like? Unparliamentary. <laughs> please, please withdraw it. <laughs> All right, they have. They have. Oh my God. Mr. Speaker, sir. Yes, Mr. Speaker, if, if it pleases you, they have repeated it without understanding why they're repeating. Okay? <laughs> huh? No, no. It will be worse, that one. So they have repeated it, repeated, 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 like, uh, like some sort of, some sort of uh, 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 discourse that, that was basically... <laughs> that, that's the best way. That is experience talking there. The automatic loudspeaker. Uh, 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 and, and, and we have so many varieties of world speakers nowadays. So, so they repeated it. Oh, what is it? We, people, the, we won the election. It's anti-democratic on their part to challenge the elections. So the Representation of People's Act, they include clauses how to challenge elections. But for them, we cannot use sections of the Representation People's Act because it is undemocratic. I, I don't understand the logic. So the lawmakers say that the sections of the law contain measures and clauses to ta challenge an election. But they say we should not do it because it's undemocratic. So we are following what 
the law says, which was democratically voted in Parliament, but following a democratically voted law in Parliament and its provisions is undemocratic. That's the New World Order version Alliance Mauritian. Then what's important as well is that they keep on saying, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, we, 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 you, you go, they're really affected or afflicted by the fact that they hold only less than 37% of the suffrage uh, exprimé. Honorable Buddha, a senior member of this August Assembly, of the MSN, has been taken so much time in explaining the mathematical, mathematical reason as to why being having less than 37% is not a problem. But let me very simplify it. Do they have only less than 37%? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, they do. They have less than 37%. I don't say that. The statistics of the Electoral Commissioner's Office say that. So they pump away and say that the office of the Electoral Commissioner, supposedly we don't have respect for him. Supposedly, because we challenge an election, we don't have respect for him. You see, where's the logic? Where's the logic? If we go before a court of law and we challenge an election, this means we have a total disrespect for him. It doesn't make sense. Where's the logic in there? So that's why I said I will not use the unparliamentary word, but it was, this is what's being done. And then they go on to say, oh, well, you know, uh, some of them went as far as to criticize the Labour Party leader, saying that he should resign, that he's lost two elections. You know what? If they are so not bothered about having only 37%, the fact remains is the majority of Mauritius voted against his government. But our electoral system is as such that they are in power and we're not. We are the ones who chose an electoral system and we live by it. But let me say something else. When I was in my constituency during the elections, the returning officer called me. Morning, first ballot, the thousand ballot boxes. Honorable Bamir Mia was there. Called me and told me one thing. He said to me, we are having a problem tallying the number of votes. And I said, well, I don't understand. He said, you're ahead. So I said, that's good news. That's not a problem. I don't find a problem there. Keep me ahead. And then he said, no, we're having a problem. He said, when we are inputting it into the computer system, it is coming out less. <laughs> that's what the returning officer said to me. That was the computer that you provided to them. That was the computer that you provided. Oh, not the Electoral Commissioner's Office. Oh, yes, SIL. And he said to me that we are going to try again. If, if all the figures, even for Dr. Asnu, even when his figures were being put in, they were coming out less. Not only for me. Eh? So please, let's, let's be very careful about that. So maybe that could give some ideas to Dr. Asnu. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm addressing you. That could give some ideas to him, sir. So, nah, come on, he's got a thick skin. Now, what I'm talking about here is the following, is that he said, because each and every time there were problems with the input in the computer system, he had taken the decision as a returning officer not to use the computer system and to go manual. That was what happened. So, you see, there have been comments here about them having won the elections. Fair enough. Fair enough. But the very simple solution to all this, I agree with the Honorable Prime Minister that a country cannot constantly be under the sword of Damocles as to the opposition challenging the legitimacy of government. You cannot constantly have the opposition challenging the legitimacy of government and have it for a long time because that undermines governance and government. You can't have that. Yes, it is important for you to have political stability. Yes, it is important for the world outside to see that we have a government that is no longer being challenged. Yes, it is important. Solution is very simple. Ask the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister to stop his dealing tactics. Ask the government and the members that are concerned by the electoral petitions to bring in a joint motion in Supreme Court that the cases be heard within a strict 
calendar, this year itself, and it's over, all done and done, dusted. That is the solution. If you've got nothing to hide, go forward, but don't come up with lame excuses like the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. I suppose, well, I will not accept service because it was done in Parliament, this and the other. Those are lame excuses for someone who does not want to face reality. Honorable Member, can you resume your Yes, seat? please, I am. Thank this you. is a right for a member of Parliament to raise a complaint, okay? Yes. You cannot question that. This is his right. Continue with your debate. I do not question his right to raise any point he wishes, just like he cannot question my right to believe that his excuse is lame. Simple. I am not questioning his right to come up with a motion in Parliament. And he cannot question my right to believe that those are excuses of a lame nature. That is what I'm saying. So, yes, this country deserves that we no longer have this challenge going on. Let the courts decide. If the courts are to decide that this is it, we are wrong. We are wrong. We will have to keep quiet and accept that we've been wrong all along. And that's it. Whereas if they are right, they are right. But at least for the public at large, for the international community, they will see that this government is no longer being challenged or this government is no longer in office, either or. But the fact remains, we cannot continue having a system of this nature continue, protract it, whereby we continue challenging it and then the process takes a year, two years, three years. Let's look at other countries where you have Supreme Court intervening, courts of appeal, uh, courts pertaining to electoral issues, within weeks it's decided. Within weeks. But in Mauritius, the trend is what? It takes years. So, in African countries that we supposedly tell them to look at us as examples, they are going faster than we are. So, please, you know, we have the solution. We don't necessarily have to have this argument about who's right and who's wrong. At the end of the day, we don't necessarily have to be right or wrong. It could be that we are half right and we're half wrong. That's possible. And if that is possible, let the court decide and off with it. Now, if he happens to lose his seat, he'll lose his seat, the Deputy Prime Minister. That doesn't matter. Government has to go on. Now, we'll feel sad for him. We'll give him a cocktail of uh, depa or whatever. But I don't know what they do sometimes. They give a gold watch and thank you very much for your contribution. But that's all. But let's get on with it. So at the end of the day, let me, let me try to say one thing. As far as this government program, I cannot... The Honorable Prime Minister has said let's reduce 10% the dépenses. Dépenses courant? He said that he is going to cancel les, les festivités pour l'indépendance in, in, uh, in order to reduce cost. But cost, fair enough. Why didn't he reduce the, the, the activity of all those women for the International Women's Day at Swami Vivekananda? Because their political speeches could be made. How much did that cost? And then they're going to say, well, it's not politically correct because for, it was for women. Oh, yes, it was for women. Fair enough. But how much did it cost? If the whole idea is to reduce costs, fair enough, tell me. I have in my hand here a government of Mauritius e-procurement issue. You know what it was? It was for a turntable. Honorable Asnu maybe is aware of that. The turntable ladder for the Mauritius Fire Services and Rescue. There was only one bidder. It was in order to renovate and maintain a vehicle that was more than 30 years old. Renovate and maintain a vehicle more than 30 years old. And that vehicle, <coughs> oh yes, no, no, yeah, water would be good, but I know, <coughs> yeah, yeah. So the thing is, money that was put aside for that particular project was maybe friends of government, backbenchers are not aware. I would hope that you are not aware because I cannot... Mr. Speaker, sir, put them in, this, uh, in the list of people who are aware but keep quiet. You see? The, the guilty knowledge part. I cannot put them in that part. I just hope that some of you do not have that guilty knowledge. Now, now that you have that knowledge, because I'm going to share it with you, it is that 25,405,200 rupees 
that was the one bidder for maintaining that particular fire engine with a ladder, turn ladder, turntable ladder. And it is only when it came to the press and it was leaked to the press, this information. I must admit, I myself leaked it. Uh, <laughs> 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 and why? Why? Because I had been informed that the Honorable Minister Asnu was made aware. Obviously, I know he's aware. I'm just pretending, I hope, saying I hope he's aware. I'm just being nice to him. I know he's aware. He was made aware but said he couldn't do anything. But when I leaked it to the press, knowing that he said he couldn't do anything, and the reason why I found this so shocking when the Honorable Prime Minister said he wants to save 10%, etc., I find this is a, a lure. It's a sham. Because here, you buy a new lorry today in the United Kingdom, 30 meter ladder, turntable, electronic, new vehicle, it costs you 500,000 pounds. Now, today, today it costs you 500,000 pounds, but the, the, the people in charge here were ready to give this contract to one company for 25 million. 400,000 rupees to maintain and repair a 30-year-old vehicle. And when I leaked it, all of a sudden, the contract was not allocated. What is the reason? Not because it was a waste of public funds. Because the bidder did not comply to all conditions. Bizarre. One bidder, his bid was accepted, his bid was open, his bid was evaluated, his bid, everything was open, the chairperson saw it, but when it was leaked to the press, oh, let's be careful now. Scandal, another one starting. And all of a sudden, for the bizarre, nonsensical reason, thank God, at least, this money for the taxpayers has not been wasted. So, when you look at the director of audits report, this has nothing to do with coronavirus. When you look at the director of audits report, for example, the Ministry of Education that was criticized when it talks about rien que les dépenses for phase one and phase two. 356 million, 164 million for the phase two of the e education project. Bad due diligence, failure to ensure that there's value for money. The, what about what about douane? I'm reading in the press here in L'Express. Le manque de coordination et d'inspection au port décrié. En 2017, la douane avait annoncé son projet d'installer des caméras de surveillance, mais en 2018, le National Maritime and Harbor Security Committee lui a demandé de collaborer avec la Mauritius Port Authority and CHCL. Sauf que la CHCL a fait fi des instructions et a modernisé son système de surveillance sans la collaboration de la douane. Sauf qu'en novembre 2019, les caméras n'avaient pas encore été installées, etc., etc. The, even the Ministry of Sports, Youth and Sports, has been criticized. Le rapport se montrait sévère concernant les dépenses de 183,91 millions budgétées durant l'année financière 2018-2019 à cet effet. Deux fédérations sportives receiving the sum of 3,74 million and one of them never able to even produce receipts for expenditure of 1.745 million. 328.6 million, Ministry of Technology de l'Information et de la Communication et de l'Innovation. I see my friend, the Honorable Minister, who was then Minister of TIC, the TIC in those days, criticized for 328.6, entre autres, that's one of them. And what about l'intégration sociale? Logement aux pauvres, promesses non tenues. What about service de la santé? Same problem. Criticized, left, right and center in the rapport de l'audit. And the Prime Minister tells us that we have to believe him that he has run the country properly. Honorable Obigadou comes forward and he tells us that he tells us that, look at the number of houses. 
he says that, I, I listened to his speech very carefully, he said between 2019, 14 and 19, 1,900 housing units were built. Okay. But when I look at the speech of his colleague, Honorable Adil, Adil, Adil Amir Mia constantly put questions in the previous mandate to Honorable Mayan Jagu. And he said on the 2nd of April to 2020, okay, he said 2,588 houses are being built. One minister, the new minister says 1,900. The former minister says 2,588. And he had also added last year, il a aussi rappelé que there will be 6,680 that will be built in one year. Yeah, before the end of the mandate, 6,680 houses will be built. So this is the new members of parliament on the other side of the house. I am I'm addressing myself to you, uh, to, you, to you, Mr. Speaker, but through you to them. This is not your fault. This is not the fault of the new members of parliament sitting here. It becomes their fault when they close their eyes to the obvious. It becomes their responsibility where they pretend that they did not hear. It becomes their fault and they can be having a finger pointed at them for wrongdoing. Now that they know, reading at that audit report, and if they pretend that they still form part of a government that has a perfect management of the economy, then they are, they are, to do, they are wrong. This audit report has been circulated en long et en large. I have not seen a single member on the other side who did not form part of their government, stand up with courage and say that they do not agree with what was done. They don't have the courage to do that. I remember the days when I was a backbencher in government led by Dr. Navin Ramgulam. I did not hesitate to criticize the government I belonged to. I never hesitated to criticize the Prime Minister Ramgulam, even though I was a backbencher with him. I did so. Today, we live in a world where everything has to go as this government wants. Because if you criticize this government, it means you're wrong and you're no longer a patriot. The freedom to think independently has disappeared. I do not like being tied down. I like thinking on my feet and expressing my views. Pleases it to some, or maybe can displease others. We say it, dans le respect de la chose. What I wish when I see the youth in this parliament, on all sides of the house, is to at least tell the people that there is hope for tomorrow. Not everything has to be surrounded by what one man, the Honorable Prime Minister Pravin Kumar Jagnak does. In all their speeches, everything, thank God we have the champion, thank God, thank God, Pravin, Pravin Kumar, Pravin Kumar Jagnak. Without him, nothing happens as though he's the only thing head there. I have never done that. I never done that. I don't do that and I speak for me. You see? You see? Let's listen. Order, please. Order, please. Listen. I have never, never in my speeches, and even I must say that I have been, remarks have been made to me by some. Why is it that in my speeches they do not contain some mot de félicitation pour le leader? It's been made to me. Because I don't. Whereas, you see, let's be, let me be very clear. Let me be very clear. You see, 50, 52 years after independence, 52 years, we are facing a viral problem of dangerous nature. That's a very intelligent remark. That's so intelligent, you're shining there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, as I was saying, anyway, so what I'm saying is very simple. We have to at least ensure that we have in this house debates, 
debates on ideas that we are not restricted in our ability to express ourselves and simply follow the whatever one person wants. That's all I'm saying. If that's so difficult and if you believe I'm wrong, okay, fair enough. Continue what you all do. Fair enough. But what I'm trying to say is be independent in your manner of thinking and think that you do not owe allegiance to anyone else but the people of this country. So as it stands right now, 52 years on after independence, what do we do? You have a country that is indebted, that you have no fiscal space to even come. You cannot even help enterprises as you should, as you could, because gouverner c'est prévoir, and you did not prévoir. Rien n'a été prévu. So today, we are in a situation where, for the first time now, now we are going to find land now you're going to find land now you're going to have digging now you're going to plant when are you going to get the crop now you're going to start giving facilities to industries to manufacture when our economy is only have, having foreign direct investment mainly for what for building of pds and else as sir jagnat used to say it simply on what on beton and nothing else the manufacturing sector is dead so please I don't find a program that is worth writing home about here. I find a situation whereby we need to work together. And I honestly believe that the decision of the Honorable Prime Minister to stop this movement of people from Europe is well taken. I would have wished that it had been taken a week earlier. My call to the Prime Minister is that schools also need to be closed. We need, we can't take risks. We need to do that because we can't take risks with the lives of our children. That universities also have to be closed. Big gatherings we have to avoid. It is not when we have one case that we start doing it because then it will be too late. So please, in the interest of the nation, my plea to the Honorable Prime Minister, since everything obviously goes through him, is to put aside any differences that we may have but please in the name of our nation and the children of this country let us protect what is already protected and ensure that no harm comes to anyone thank you very much